Professor Inouye, first, thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed in this series. Um, we are particularly happy to have you join in the series, largely because so few scholars today have ventured to pass beyond the confines of Imperial China. So, you know, you've, you've written at least one piece about, uh, I guess, notions of modernity and print culture uh, uh, that, that sort of ends with the late Qing and then sort of transists into the Republican era. But, uh, but you've written in, into, uh, in many ways, terra incognita for some. That is, the, the predominance of scholarship in China Christianity studies has been, as you know, Matteo Ricci, uh, Giulio Eleni, and, and those, those, those hallowed Jesuits of that, of that late imperial era. Um, so it's just great that, that you have added, contributed to our understanding to the history of diverse theologies uh, in, in China in terms of Christ, the Christian community. Um, and we were thinking especially about your uh, work on the Zhenye uh, Zhujiahui, the True Jesus Church, and especially Wei Enbo, many of us sort of liken him to Hong Xiuquan. Uh, one had this idea that he was the younger brother of Jesus, and one had this uh, reported to have been baptized by Jesus. And, um, and your book, by the way, is in my office. I just received it. It's next to my favorite reading chair. So I'm looking forward to returning and reading the book. But our, our goal, I guess, now is to hear what you have to say. So um, let's just uh, begin with the first question. Uh, I wonder if you could just reflect upon what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies and maybe even add a bit in terms of what attracted you to the specific topics about which you've researched? Thanks for that question. Thank you also for having me. I'm just so honored to be part of this eminent group of scholars. I kind of don't know what to say, um, but I'll try to say something since you've asked the question. So in terms of how I got into the field of the history of Christianity in China, I was actually an East Asian studies major at Harvard and I was focusing on literature. And for our junior paper, we were supposed to take a kind of major chunk of literature from Chinese history and write about it. And I ended up discovering this journal in the archives in the Yenching Library. And it was the history of a Protestant missionary named Andrew Stripmotter. And he was complaining about how difficult it was to learn Chinese and how the tones meant that all the, you know, you could say the same words five different times and it would mean a different thing every single time. And um, I was just so struck by that the familiarity of his tone and the familiar problems that he described. I was trying to learn Chinese too. And it was just so amazing that he had written down these experiences and stuck them into a, in, in, you know, into papers and someone had saved those and they were here in the library and I was now reading them. I was just, that kind of collapsing of time and space was just so seductive for me. And so that was the first thing. And then uh, the second thing that you asked about was, oh, sorry, so going back to that other thing. So at that time, um, my one of my advisors was Phil Kuhn, who is a historian of Christianity, no, sorry, a historian of China, a very eminent historian who knows everything. And uh, he later agreed to advise a senior thesis on missionaries in China. So that was kind of how I got into that. And then the question of how I became interested in the True Jesus Church, I was in Nanjing. No, I wasn't in Nanjing. I was in another city, which I now realize in this other city, I should keep it nameless. So I was in this nameless other city. And um, my husband was there doing work for his law career. He was interning at some sort of organization. And um, my husband's this tall white guy. And so we had this very cute half Asian kid who always kind of drew attention on buses. And so we were on this bus and um, this, the cute half Asian kid drew attention. And my husband stuck, struck up this conversation with this lady who you know, really liked the kid. And she said she was headed to a church meeting. Did he want to come? And he's like, oh, what church meeting? He's like, is it a, is it a three self church meeting? And she said, no. He said, oh, is it a house church meeting? And she said, no. And that kind of confused my husband because, you know, I said a Christian, you know, I talk about the different things and, you know, he's also really well aware of the situation in China. And so he's like, if it's not a three self church and it's not a house church, then like, Dali, what kind of church right, can it what be? What is it? Yeah. And that was how 
we, I became aware of the really robust activities of the True Jesus Church in, in mainland China. And I say mainland China because I had been aware of their activities in Taiwan, but I didn't know anything about them in Dalu. So that was the beginning of my interest in them. And also not just aside from the fact of being kind of interested in them, uh, not knowing that they were in mainland China, but I've also, um, one of the ways that I, I learned Chinese was as a Mormon missionary in Taiwan. And so I've always been really interested in heterodoxy and, uh, and orthodoxy and you know what moves those lines around and the boundaries of those realms. So that's how I became interested in the true Jesus church. Uh, you know, I just should say what I uh, uh, studied in Taiwan. I also studied classical Chinese in Taiwan. The, the Mormon temple was literally just a block away. <laughs> Ah, from where I right. lived, right? So I, I remember there were all these posters, you know, the LDS missionaries had these posters for studying Chinese there, or studying English there. Right, 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 English. Right? Which I thought was just great. And many of the, <laughs> um, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, students there would say, I'm having this great discussion. My, lingu my English is getting so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got real language models there. Right, right. American you know, Chinese. The, the next question then is, um, is really about, I sort of geared toward historians. Um, I know that theologians have said to me, we don't have eureka moments in, in our research. We don't have moments where we reframe things. We add layers uh, to our understanding. But historians um, often have a moment wherein we discover something in our research that might redirect our, our, our way of thinking about our topic. So I wonder if you have had any sort of historian's eureka moment, a, a moment where during your research, uh, uh, you encountered something that changed how you thought about your topic? I remember the first time I learned that Wang Mingdao had recanted, had, had taken back his kind of defiant prophetic utterances against the state system and said, um, and said, okay, I will, I'll go with the flow. And then the second time when he was like, actually, I said that under duress. Hmm. And, you know, I had, I had studied the history of Christianity in China for a long time, but I hadn't, um, I hadn't learned about Wang Mingdao until a bit later, a lot later actually, into my understanding of Christianity, Christianity in China. And it was so striking to me that in a community, you know, where truth, and kind of this idea of eternal justice and, you know, just the unshakable nature of God and all these kinds of things in that sort of community that someone could make such dramatic turns. Hmm. And, and, I, and the kind of weight of that, uh, you know, of in the first place, um, going along with the Maoist state in the second place saying, no way, I said it under duress, you know. I just said, whoa, <laughs> that's a big deal. That must have been so hard for him at each, at each juncture. Right, right. It must have been shattering for the community. And if someone like Wang Mingdao you know, at one point, eventually just kind of caved and went with the flow, then of course, most Chinese Christians, you know, just lived in this world where you just had to go with the flow. And I think that changed some of the moral values that I had assigned previously to quote unquote collaboration or resistance. And I realized that, you know, those categories are kind of arbitrary and to expect that someone would just kind of neatly fit into one or the other mm -hmm. is is asking quite a lot and i probably couldn't ask that much of myself you know in that same situation so i guess i feel like i had a lot of empathy for all the chinese christians no matter what stance they took and, and more broadly you know just people in china who had lived a kind of a life in which in the first part of their life their moral ideal their moral ideology had been their own 
right. like they had had kind of control over it or they identified with it or you know it was like a kind of product of their their own product and then for the second or period of their life or for this other phase of their life it just wasn't just was not really in their control anymore in the same way and I, yeah i just felt a lot more empathy for them in that situation and so you you actually touch upon something fascinating to me and and something that a lot of scholars in our field think about and that is the kind of diurnal grassroots level life of christians especially in certain political contexts and um Here's my first tangent question. But you, you, you mentioned Wang Mingdao, right? And his shift under this, what we call Jie Fang Ho, right? The post-liberation uh, uh, era. Um, you know, in your own research, uh, and I guess I asked this question because so often, you know, people like me, I try to focus more on the Qing dynasty. Um, in researching this, this post-1949 Christian history, um, what, what, I guess I would say, you know, within sensitivity, within prudence, what challenges or what uh, kind of discoveries or what um, what insights have you gained thinking about Christianity post-1949? Um, from a sort of methodological point of view, I've become a lot more cautious because as you say, it's a, this is quite a sensitive topic now. And when I was doing the research, it wasn't as sensitive. Right. And so that's a kind of cautionary tale to me, which is that we should actually, as, as researchers, we should kind of err on the side of extreme sensitivity and even indeed paranoia, because um, you know, we don't control how those political winds shift. So if we're not paying attention, then we could inadvertently, you know, a statement that's innocuous in 2007 can be a really different story in 2017. So just from a methodological point of view, I would concur with you that it's it's not a really easy time period to work in. And then um, just in terms of what I've learned about kind of post-1949 post Christianity, I think that I was surprised when I was researching the True Jesus Church at the kind of strident nationalism within the church. Mm. I was surprised to hear people say, we are really excited for China to kind of take over Africa and South America because then we will be respected as Christians. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Um, I had, you know, previously I had, I had met with a lot of people a lot of people, I, when I was studying, like, for example, the Three Self Church, I had met people within that, even within those congregations who were very uh, kind of externally oriented and who thought that it was a shame that the Tiananmen incident had been covered up and, and those kinds of things. But I also found within, within the True Jesus Church and other indigenous Chinese groups nationalism is a very powerful force and it, in the true jesus church it came out in this really interesting way as i said you know people don't think that the people would say I'm, I'm paraphrasing you know people don't think that our christianity is very biaozhen because mm -hmm. you know we're chinese and they think that you know christianity is like a european thing but when china has power then they will <laughs> right. take it seriously so i was like huh that's that's really interesting and um At the same time, I, I, I did talk to many leaders of the church who had to kind of deal more intimately with the levers of power mm -hmm. in the municipal and county and even national levels. And I think they were a little more ambivalent because they were a little more aware of those trade-offs and the tensions and the power struggles. And right, so on. right. Yeah. It's usually that you conjure nationalism in, in, in sort of... In, in in conjunction with this post-1949 Christian thing, uh, history, because- oh, There's always been nationalism, I guess. Right, but but no, but it actually, ha it's, it's I think, trans it's, it's been sort of morphed into a different kind of nationalism. 
um, uh, that that is interesting because you know one sees in Chinese on Chinese church chalkboards outside as you enter, or or sort of on the bulletin boards, one sees all sorts of nationalistic slogans now that um, I, I can't imagine seeing during the Qing Dynasty, but maybe in a different way, right? I mean, we had stele with with imperial edicts. Well, you know, you're talking about China, so um, and experiences that you've had there. And the, the next question, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily center on, on, on an experience you've had in China. Uh, it could be elsewhere. But um, might you have uh, a certain experience during your time researching, either in China or elsewhere, or more than one experience, uh, that was particularly meaningful just as an experience? Hmm. From a sort of um, fruits of research point of view, I had a number of experiences in um, the kind of uh, countryside areas of, of the place where I was researching in China, where I heard a lot of really interesting, very lively stories that would have interested, you know, scholars of religion in China, not just scholars of Christianity in China, where it was pretty clear that kind of existing lore about demons and devils hmm. was kind of combined with Christian ideas. Not as if, you know, demons and Christians are two mutually exclusive categories, but just like the kind of existing demonology was combining with Christian demonology. Hmm. That was very interesting and memorable. Um, but in terms of something that was kind of personally moving, or personally affecting to me is I did attend, uh, I, I, I attended so many meetings of the True Jesus Church in the course of my field work. But at one meeting, which I actually describe in my book, I was in a um, Lord's Supper, right? And it was a group of young people who had kind of assembled for this rite. And they sang a hymn over and over again it was the same hymn. It was a good hymn. It had a really good melody. And it was just, you know, I'm not a co-religionist of the True Jesus Church. And a lot of their religious practices are quite foreign to me in terms of, um, you know, the liturgy or the, you know, the, the physical forms of the rite or whatever, uh, the symbols, et cetera. But um, I was, I found it profoundly moving. I think I wept. Everyone was weeping. I think I wept too. Um, it was just very moving. And again, it was one of those moments where you realize as a researcher that you have an obligation to the people you study um, to take them seriously, right. to not treat them as a bunch of irrational wackos because the you know emotions reveal deep assumptions and longings and worldviews that are real, that are rooted in our very chemistry, you know? And so I was, I could feel in that moment, um, it's not a very scientific way to say that, but I could feel in that moment, you know, the depth of their conviction that the ritual in which they were engaged was real and valid and deeply desirable for these pretty educated, pretty middle class, you know, completely law abiding, very rational Chinese young people. This, this experience conjures a question, another question that is, um, you know, when we think about people like uh, Wei Anbo, uh, Paul Wei, I think of his I think of the true Jesus church as a kind of almost an admixture, a little bit of the Adventist and charismatic traditions, right? And those two traditions sort of combining, and you mentioned liturgy and worship. Um, this is a, an unplanned question, but I wonder if you might sort of address or describe a, 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 a typical um, Zhen Yezu Jiao Hui worship experience wherein maybe this Adventist and charismatic tradition sort of mixed together. What does a traditional service look like? Oh, gee, it's been such a long time since I've been in those spaces. So I'm afraid I'm going to miss 
characterize this. So um, I will just kind of broadly recall uh, a kind of standard Sabbath service is on a, a Friday and a Saturday morning, Friday evening, Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And there is a kind of, uh, there's prayer at numerous times during the meeting, but there is one kind of period of prayer that's longer than usual in which um, there's a kind of formal setup for the prayer. I think it's usually after the sermon, but now I'm not trusting myself. So but there's this period of prayer and um, in the period of prayer, um, they say, now we're going to pray and everyone kind of um, immediately settles into this attitude of prayer. Some people have their hands pressed together um, as it gets vocal, people are kind of moving, people are vocalizing, and that lasts until s the person at the front who's in charge rings the bell, and then it mm. instantly stops. There's also, as part of this kind of standard worship service, there's a couple of sermons, usually there's kind of like a warm-up sermon, and then there's a more advanced sermon often given by an elder or a preacher, some kind of church official or an itinerating um, preacher. Uh, the more low-key sermons, the, the warm-up ones, are often kind of sharing some sort of experience or of prayer or reading scriptures or, uh, you know, drawing some sort of scriptural parallel. And then the bigger sermon is um, you know, usually a little more complex, a kind of a topic with a lot of scriptural riffs. Um, I think um, one scholar has said it has, has specifically nailed down the term that the true Jesus Church pastors use, which is stringing beads. Mm. Um, so stringing together a ton of scriptures and kind of overwhelming the audience with this, you know, scriptural evidence from all over the Bible. And um, there's song at uh, multiple points in the, it is, it's a very, um, It's a very kind of folksy, uh, kind of low church, kind of evangelical style. It's not like an Anglican service or a Catholic service. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. And then the, the, the occasionally there are these, uh, in some parts of the Jesus Church, um, the Lord's Supper rite is, is included in special meetings, usually. Not all the time, maybe like a couple of times a year or for special occasions. And those are a little more formal and a little more um, ritualistic. And the atmosphere is a little more elevated. You know, it's, it's what a description. Um, what, one thing that I think about is in 1949, of course, there were 3 million Catholics and 1 million Protestants. And now it's the opposite. It's 75% mm -hmm. Protestant, 25% Catholic. And, um, you know, it's, thing, it's, it's groups like the True Jesus Church that are really attracting so many Chinese to that form of worship. And, um, you know, some people have speculated that it's, the, it's really the kind of maybe the charismatic dimension that has attracted so many uh, believers. Yeah, I think it's that combined with the fact that it's quite accessible. You know, no, like the right. preaching can be supplied by a lot of different people. It right. doesn't have to be led by a particular ordained representative of God. You know, mm -hmm. like it, it's a lot more accessible. Right. Well, um, the, the point of the interview really is to hear from you about you, but we have reserved one question uh, wherein uh, we're asking if you might have a particular pleasant memory, a significant memory of another scholar in our field. So everyone has spent a little bit of time talking about someone else or even more than one person. But, but do you have a, a, a particular memory about another scholar in the field um, that you think should be remembered? I do. I have a couple actually. And I have a kind of chauvinistic theory, which is that, um, I personally think that scholars of Christianity in China are really nice, kind people. I could just be making that up. But, but like, I, I do remember one conference at Purdue, I think, and Dan Bayes' wife was there. 
And um, at the end of the meeting, I think she got up and, and basically kind of like testified before the, you know, the before the community of scholars, you know, this has been so interesting and everyone's so nice. And usually I've been to these conferences that my husband goes to and they're so boring, but this one was really good. But um, so I have many stories of um, kind of fellow scholars in our field. Uh, so just actually to use that example, at that conference um, at Purdue, uh, Daniel Bates was in attendance and he came over to me and he said, Melissa, you work on the True Jesus shirt, that's so great. And um, can I send you some materials? Because I've got all these old materials I'm not doing anything with that I, you know, I've gathered on the True Jesus Church. And I said, absolutely, thanks so much. And so he sent me this you know, thick envelope containing a lot of his materials. And in them was a letter that he had written. I think it was like in the 1990s, hmm. um, maybe like the early or to mid 1990s when he was kind of first getting into this research. And he, um, it was a message, that, a letter that he was writing to a True Jesus Church leader. And it said something like, you know, dear True Jesus Church leader, um, it was such a pleasure to, to see you. And, you know, I've been doing this work on your um, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and he just wrote it in a way where he kind of affirmed, you could tell that the True Jesus Church leader had been sharing with him a lot of kind of faith promoting things like, you know, why the True Jesus Church is, is the one true church and um, why we are a really awesome Christian religion. And that um, Professor Bayes was kind of approaching, approaching this from a little more um, detached standpoint, a kind of research-oriented standpoint. But in that letter, you could see a, a lot of personal warmth expressed to this True Jesus Church leader and a lot of respect for the, the things that he had shared. You know, thank you so much for sharing these things with me, blah, 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 blah. And, and I just was struck by that example of, you know, how human um, Professor Bayes was. And I think a lot of people in our field are because they, you know, they're, they're interested in people's beliefs and their practices and um, these kind of weird things that humans do. Um, you know, I'm a very weird human myself. I do weird things. But um, it was just like such a human letter. And I, I really respected Professor Bates. I always knew he was like that, but I could feel it in this letter. And, um, and I thought he's just a great example of someone who treats people like people and who treats relationships with people who, you know, he interviews as like real people, not just like research subjects and right. assets or you know something like that and then um another kind of example of of the kind of kind human mentoring that i've had in this field is my dissertation advisor at harvard was henrietta harrison mm -hmm. and i feel such respect for her she's just such an amazing person and she does all these interesting things so there was this one time when i was a young scholar i, I had a job i think um i was doing some research at soas in London and she um, she let me stay like it was like her, her parents apartment or something like that um, and I needed a place to stay so she she took me in um, and, and I, I spent the night there and I found out all these really interesting things about her like she likes to um, sew quilts you know how people quilt um, you know with like sewing machines usually oh, right right she quilts by hand wow like with a needle Yes. Yeah. That like says so much to me about her. That explains a lot. You know, no wonder her scholarship is so amazingly detailed and careful and mm -hmm. like, you know, there's no mistakes in it because, you know, anyway. Um, so I, I learned this about her. And then we were um we were walking through um this area, like the gardens by Kensington Palace or something like that. And you know, I'm this like American, you know, with no you know, this boorish American with you know no awareness of you know any of these things. And I was I was just thinking. I was telling her, um, oh, I was coming from Hong Kong. I, I think I, I think I was coming from Hong Kong. I had kids in Hong Kong and, you know, Hong Kong is like a super competitive educational environment. And so I was walking through Kensington Garden, like you know, these gardens around Kensington, looking at the palace and thinking, oh, I'm just so jealous of those British royals because they don't have to worry about getting their kids into school, you know, like, and, and she said, well, I don't envy them at all. I think there's quite a lot of pressure on their children to turn out quite bad. Or maybe she said badly because bad is bad grammar. But you know, she said like, there's, there's a lot of pressure on their children to like not turn out very well. And I was like, oh. Um, but you know, she, she just, she, she has a, such a wonderful perspective on things. She's so down to earth and 
um, I, I was always coming to her as a student with these kind of, you know, fires, ah, I'm on fire, put me out. And she was just so um, sensible and, you know, smart and just kind of has this overall calming influence on people and is able to see that, you know, even for the highest, you know, the highest born and the richest people in the land, you know, even they are real people and they have to deal with real human problems. And I think she's just really good at seeing that humanity. Yeah, you know, um, gosh, there's so much about that answer that that uh, resonates with me. I, I, you're not the first scholar to note just how kind people tend to be in, in our field. And, and actually many, several, have noted that they were sort of flirting with other fields or had intended to be in other fields, but the community was so congenial in China Christianity studies, uh, equally rigorous. I mean, I'm thinking about Henrietta, right? Incredibly rigorous, great scholar, but that this, this the, the sort of personality of the community was so uh, attractive. Oh, wait, <laughs> actually, I remember one more thing about her that like should be, should be shared with generations, which is that um, early in my grad student career, um, as I was starting to actually have materials and actually know something about the True Jesus Church, um, there were some other scholars who were kind of passing through who, who, were, who were kind of like on my turf and um, studying the same thing and we're gonna you know stay at my house and meet with me and like, consult with me and so I was just you know grad students are really insecure and like when you finally have like a little piece of something you kind of like don't want to give away your good stuff and so I asked Henrietta you know what's the policy on this like what should I do should I like just tell him like you know general things but like keep my good stuff or whatever or like you know what's the kind of professional strategy and she said, I think that people should just be generous with their scholarship as you would be generous in real life. And that was like an aha moment for me. Like you didn't have to have like one set of values for the world of scholarship and one set of values for the world of being a normal person. You could just be generous mm -hmm. and it would be okay. So I think that's um, something I learned from her as well. Right, uh, it's so funny. Daryl Ireland, just I met with him this morning and he, one of the things he said was exactly what you just mentioned. That is, <laughs> in our field, we should be generous. That, that, that the sort of collaborative approach is really kind of a mark of, of what we do. Um, that is, that is it. and I should say, by the way, um, Henrietta, she, she has actually helped me. I was writing a book about Shanxi province and she was writing a book about this, essentially the same place, different angles. And I received such generous kind of emails from her and we exchanged uh, thoughts and information. And um, yeah, she, she really does model that kind of generosity. Well, there's one other question that's sort of the final question, maybe the penultimate question. And that is uh, many scholars who haven't yet published, who are either maybe they're doctoral candidates and they're doing their research, uh, have, have shown an interest in asking scholars who've published a monograph, uh, who are established, what your hopes are for the future of the field. And we're, we're really a new field. I would say Dan Bayes was one of those people, Kathleen Lodwick was another, who sort of codified this whole idea of a field in China Christianity studies. Um, but do you, do you have any reflections or some, some ideas of hopes that you might have for the future of the field? Well, the future of our field is intricately tied up with the future of the world's relationship with China, yeah. which is a kind of blessing and a curse. Right. Uh, it's a blessing because we're always relevant, because there are always things that people, you know, there are things that the world just needs to understand about Chinese history or Chinese culture and to be able to appreciate those things in ways that aren't usually appreciated. And the curse, of course, is that it's a highly politicized and um, charged situation often. Um, right now, it's a pretty difficult research environment. Right. Uh, if you take away COVID, even if you take away COVID, it's still a pretty difficult research environment. So I think that blessing and curse is, is in many ways what attracts people to our field because China is so important and Christianity is one of those pressure zones in terms of relationships between China and the West. 
where a lot of kind of interesting and complex forces come to a head and exist in tension with each other. So those tensions are really interesting, very important, but also, you know, tense. <laughs> so, so my hope is um, that our field will um, not only continue to concern itself with issues of truth and power, um, speaking truth to power, truth about power, right. um, flagging the ways in which information, facts, stories about things are power, but also in terms of, you know, moving the world uh, towards a better relationship in the, in the world, including China, towards a better relationship with itself, um, being able to capture the people Mm -hmm. that are involved. So I, I hope that our field can not only um, illuminate these kind of larger geopolitical stages and uh, expressions of the tensions that are playing out in China in the past and also in the kind of more recent eras. But also, I hope our scholars in our field will be able to show people and to show that you know china as a word is often pretty unhelpful uh, because it conjures up all these different things which don't often have a lot to do with you know the people that one meets mm -hmm. in these places and people who have you know lives just like all of us and who live in neighborhoods and who have friends and family so I think it's so easy because China is just so big and so different in many ways to forget about um, the kind of human aspects of those 1.3 billion people and, and to just, you know. And I think Richard Madsen is really good at this actually because right. he talks about, you know, he says the US and China don't have a clash of cultures or a clash of values. Duh, like there's huge overlap mm -hmm. between our values. Right. And um, I think when we who study this traditionally tense, traditionally in between sort of space, when we focus on people, I think that's where our work has the, um, has the potential to be most useful to everyone else. You know, right. people talk about like, putting one more brick in the temple of knowledge or whatever like that. I'm completely uninterested in that. Completely uninterested. I, I want to do work that brings people together and helps us see each other as human beings. Right. That, that um, your final remark uh, really is a, a great transition into my final question. And that is, um, if you're not going to add another brick, and I, I that that is that is also how, <laughs> that is also how I in, in try to envision my own work, right? And and I think that one of my favorite works, a missionary work, is is I hate to go back to Ricci because he's it almost seems hackneyed, but his you know this Jiao Yu Lun, you know his essay on friendship, is something that uh, for me is almost the kernel of what this enterprise, this missionary enterprise was all about, right? And, and that's in a way the kernel of what scholarship should be about. Um, so the, I guess the, my final question is, so what's next? So many people have praised your book and I still need to read it, but, but what's, what's next for you in this field? Well, I hope it's still in the field. I'm writing a, my next book project is on um, organizations, uh, that's what I really think is exciting about Christianity in China. It's about this new form of organization. So it's about organizations in China, um, including not only churches, but like the Wang Guo Dao De Hui, mm. uh, Worldwide Ethical Society. And um, these like this, oh shoot, it's been too long in the pandemic. I've forgotten the name of this other organization. Um, an organization run by Gilbert Reed. Mm. Oh, okay. Okay, so Gilbert Reed was um, you know, this Christian missionary who at one point was one of the leaders of the Worldwide Ethical Society, who also ran, oh, who ran this other mission to convert the upper classes of China. It was literally, you know, the mission to the upper classes or something like that. Like, 
hilarious um in, in that it's like not very egalitarian from my current perspective but anyway um so i'm interested in these organizations um oriented around morality mm. including like you know silk workers movements and things like that but just this this question where this i'm interested in organizations where the kind of organizing impetus was this moral ideal was something you couldn't see you know this thing that everyone was supposed to have in common was supposed to be the, the righteousness at the core of the endeavor i'm really interested in that because um i don't know i just um, that, that, that was like why i was interested in the true jesus church too because it's this new form of organization and you know it's so powerful got a lot of people to do important things and change their lives and is similar to communism, you know, in China, it's just, it's just so many people. It's just so interesting to see what moves people literally mm -hmm. and um, breaks them out of the kind of traditional patterns of their lives. And yeah, I'm also interested. So, so what something that is exclusively Christianity and China oriented is I'm working on this idea of cultural technologies like Christianity. Um, Christian meetings is a cultural technology. And the basic idea, um, which I've articulated in an article recently, but I'm kind of, I'm still kind of um, chewing through, is this idea that maybe the most significant impact of the Christian missions in China wasn't the making of more Christians. I mean, if you look at the, the kind of ratio between the hours they spent doing stuff in China to the converts they gained, right, is like not that much, right? Mm -hmm. But then what were they doing with all those other hours, right? Um, so when I look at it, I think that in some ways, some of the institutions they introduced, like choral singing or group singing, or, um, you know, it's kind of congregational self-governance form and the prayer meeting form, all of those things in some ways, I think have, have informed Chinese political culture. And, um, and created these new ways for people to organize in China and come together and be ideologically directed. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a kind of technology, right? Like, right. you know, him singing gets a, a bunch of people to shut up and look in one direction and like breathe together mm -hmm. very right. in a very coordinated way. Right. That's pretty important. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a, as a mother or, you know, or, someone who's always looking for technologies to get people to stop talking and like <laughs> focus on one thing, you know, it's pretty powerful. And, you know, and it's, you know, scene in particular, that kind of congregational scene is very, you know, deeply embedded in modern Chinese political culture. And a lot of the early communist leaders like Jiang Qing and, um, and others had ties, you know, to the YMCA or to other Christian groups. Right. This is an excellent project. I I can't help but reflect on it. I'm just now in Eugene, Oregon. University of Oregon is very near to where I sit. And uh, one of the most popular classes for Chinese students at the, at the University of Oregon is the gospel choir class. Oh. I absolutely love that class. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, um, well, you know, our time is just, it looks like it's, it's uh, we're, we're at that moment. Um, I, I want to just take a moment to... Um, to thank you for your contribution to our field personally. Um, you know, reading some, some of your articles, it's, it's so helpful. I'm eager to read your book, of course. Um, in fact, it, in my office, it, your book is just right behind me to, by my left hand. So it's waiting to be pulled off and read. Um, mm -hmm. So often we cite people and we don't have a chance to thank them. So uh, this is my chance to thank you for your, your work and your contribution. And, and especially thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. What rich, um, answers you provided. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. It's been so fun. Great. Thanks so much.